You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, I'm Lisa Birnbach. Welcome to the podcast. Believe it or not, it's episode 70. 70. Wow, who to thunk it? Here are the things that I want to just toss off for you today, things that are on my mind. How dark the dusk feels now that we've changed our clocks and set them ahead. A kind of sad elegy on a shortened day. I'm thinking about the wheels of justice. And are they whirring backwards or just stuck in the muck of political partisanship? But I'm also thinking about all the adorable pictures I've seen of babies and children in their Halloween costumes, including my own Exhibit E, who is dressed as a chicken. The beauty of the fall here in the Mid-Atlantic and how my guest this week, Megan Dom, is one of the smartest people I know. Her new book, The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars, published by Gallery Books, Simon & Schuster, takes aim at the wokeness at the center of the young progressive talking points. And yet, she's a progressive. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Anyway, here are my five things that made this week better. Number one. The Wing. The Wing, in case you don't know, is a workspace for women only. It is blush pink, or do we call that millennial pink? I think we do. Very well designed and comfortable space to be a club and a hangout. You can meet people that you already know. You can, I think, have a conference room and bring in people for meetings. You can eat. They have very chic child care there. You can take a shower or attend special programs. There are now wings in nine cities, three or four in New York and Brooklyn, in Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and London, with more to come in the next year. Now, this week, I had a program with E. Jean Carroll at the Wing Soho branch. You know, of course, that we're friends. Her bravery is something the wingers wanted to see and understand up close. And the questions from the audience were nuanced and sincere. I think we all learn from one another. Number two, cauliflower cheesecake. Uh Uh-huh. With cauliflower ice cream. Okay, don't puke. You heard that right. And by the way, I did not eat cauliflower ever until I hit I would say 50. My whole first 50 years were blissfully cauliflower free. I liked Brussels sprouts. No, I should say I loved Brussels sprouts. I liked broccoli, would not eat cauliflower. Now I'm going to rave to you about cauliflower cheesecake. Uh, Listen, I don't know how they did it. It's at a restaurant called Dirt Candy. Yes, that is its name on the Lower East Side. It's an all-vegetable restaurant, and get this, it's a tasting menu only. So you can't say, I want pasta with mushrooms. You can't say anything except thank you. Or, what? Cauliflower? It was so good. I don't know what they did. I ate cauliflower cheesecake, and I would have had a second slice. That's all I can say. It was crazy. Cauliflower ice cream crazily good. And I think cauliflower is kind of the new black, isn't it? Isn't cauliflower, now you can get pizza with cauliflower crust and rice cauliflower is the new rice. I don't know. This is a moment for cauliflower. I just want it to like me. By the way, we also had carrot sliders. So it was kind of a patty-sized morsel of carrot, sautéed, I guess, on a roll that was probably made out of the tears of men and quinoa. And the carrot was drizzled with a perfect little mm, soupçon of honey mustard. I don't usually like honey mustard, by the way, but I liked it on my carrot slider. Anyway, it's called Dirt Candy, and try it if you're brave. Number three, what happened in Virginia this week? Namely, the Democrats, to everyone's surprise, retook the state house and the state Senate for the first time in about 30 years. It is suggested that at this point, Virginia could become the 38th state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. I'm just going to leave that there because you know what? 
Hope is not a little thing anymore. Hope, hope is good. Number four, my bathrobe. It's newish. For the longest time, I only had big, heavy terry cloth bathrobes, reversible and lined, and they were heavy and they were warm. They were really warm and absorbent, but they were so heavy, they weighed me down. And come to think of it, when I think of one of those big, heavy white bathrobes, I think of Harvey Weinstein. So that's not an image I want associated with me. So I ordered a short cotton kimono with little print on it. I ordered it online, and I love it. And I feel I got, I'm got i kind of excited to put it on now. Isn't that weird? It's not just this heavy garment, but it's perfect. And it's modest enough. It comes to my knee that when the super shows up to fix the toilet, again, I'm wearing it. And I feel totally covered up. And when I wrote this blog, I was wearing my bathrobe. And I know you could feel that. Number five. The radiator smell. Does the heat in your house have a smell when it goes on? I don't mean a bad smell. I just mean there's a certain quality to the air when the radiator gets to working. They turn it on when the thermostat is at, I don't know, 50 or 40 outside. And then suddenly you smell that radiator smell. You hear the hissing of the pipes of the radiator. And far from being offended or upset, I just love it because it means I'm going to be warm in the morning. You know, I need that. That is it for my five things. Coming up, Megan Dom, a complicated Gen Xer. (laughs) Megan Dom is in the studio. I first became aware of her when I read My Misspent Youth and read about her in The New Yorker and her spending problem. And then she moved to Nebraska. She's one of those people who isn't just uh, a a talker. She's a walker also. Her new book is called The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. And I'm going to try to describe it as one woman's well-thought-out Uh, complaint and uh, identification of the self-absorbed, self-involved culture that requires us to all warn one another when we're about to trigger something, which makes us all want to scoot into safe spaces and blame everybody else for stuff that's our problem. And also, she does it with humor. I don't know if I did that right, Megan, but I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy to be here, Lisa. I adore you. That's a great summary. It's really hard to summarize this book. It's hard. It's about everything. It's about the problem with everything. So how can you narrow it down? Exactly. It's the problem of everything. And I underlined a lot in this book. And I want to start with this. Search for grievance hours or one search for grievance these days has become a kind of political obligation an activist gesture, or at least something that passes for one. It seems that we are, as a society, looking to feel like a victim or blame people else and make them the victim. There's no sort of understanding of our own responsibility. And I I don't know who the culprit is. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah. So... I can address that, I guess, first through the lens of the discussion around women. So a lot because I am a woman, that is sort of the framework of this book, although it branches out into other areas of cultural debate and identification. So there are a set of approved messages and assumptions that women are in acute danger on college campuses, for example, that the gender wage gap is the result of blatant discrimination, uh, that women are being kept out of STEM fields because of misogyny, this sort of thing. And what happens is these ideas get connected to slogans and then they become articles of faith and social media turns them into memes so we're you know 79 cents on the dollar one in five women raped that kind of thing these are statistical slogans and so then if they become memes and they become almost vehicles of style right you can wear a shirt that says feminist in, right. in rhinestones and and you can buy into this patently absurd idea that being a woman in the 21st century means facing the patriarchy down at every turn and it's so difficult that just getting 
going through the day makes you a badass, right? So, <laughs> right. And this, wow. and that he, was seven T-shirts right there. Yeah, and so it mushrooms into these broad and equally meaningless statements, like the idea that there's a world, there's, there's a war on women. The world hates women, and this becomes its own vocabulary, right? And pretty soon you get into this paradoxical dynamic where being a strong woman means constantly underscoring your own weakness. So to your point, there's there's a sort of valor in victimization. And I, and I hate to put it in such crude terms because that's like what people on the right say, but yeah. it, it is certainly a phenomenon. Well, what's interesting, since you said it, is that a lot of the arguments in the problem with everything do sound like themes that the right brings up, and yet you're not on the right. And it's, you know, I'm proud that you're um, a provocateur, and I'm proud that you're kind of uh, taking after Aunt Fuddy Duddy in the sense, I don't do such brainy work as you, but in the sense that you don't have to accept something just because it's become slogan. Right. And you don't have to believe it. But there is a very, I can't say well thought out, or, or but there's a very extensive and robust group of arguments against what you just said that will say that women have become ridiculed and minimized and it's the patriarchy and it's racist and it's sexist. Yes. Uh, those arguments exist. I think you and I hear them uh, daily from from lots of different people. And really, that that conflict is where this book lives. This is not a polemic. I'm not a, I'm not a political writer. I'm not a polemicist. I'm an essayist. This is not a collection of essays. This is a written through book with chapters. But what I wanted to do in terms of approaching all of this was not to just hammer away at, oh, you know, I'm tired of, of hashtag uh, kill all men yeah. and, and, uh, and, you know, Believe ta- talking women. about toxic masculinity. Right. I mean, I am sick of this stuff. Yeah. But, but what's more interesting is to go back and, and try to figure out why. What is it about either my generation or my temperament that is making me uh, not relate to these ideas as much as people of younger generations. And that's really the heart of this book. It's a self-interrogation. It is not an argument. Oh, that's very, yes, right. Because you do very often in the book talk about how you are sitting at your computer and uh, downloading all this, all this talk and all this, I don't know, what would you call it, even static and noise pollution of the slogans of the day. As we all do, if we're on Facebook or Twitter, it's like the whole thing. It's very hard to know where you stand. I mean, I almost have sympathy for people who believe the last person they heard from. Because... (laughs) It just keeps you saner. Well, it just... But but there's that kind of flip-floppy whiplash that you feel when you're reading stuff online. But if... If an argument is cogent, it almost doesn't matter what it's an argument for sometimes. Right. So a lot of what drives this is, you know, I grew up right alongside second wave feminism. I was born in 1970. I was three years old in 1973 when Roe v. Wade passed, when abortion became legal. I remember in 1982 sitting in the kitchen with my mother listening to NPR and hearing that the Equal Rights Amendment was not going to be ratified she was really sad about that. My mother was uh, very much a second wave feminist. Um, and, you know, through these decades, I never had a sense of myself uh, as a girl as being anything but equal to boys. If anything, the girls were better than the boys. They did better in school. Mm-hmm. They just had their acts together. By the time I was in college in the late 80s, there were more women going to college than men. They're getting advanced degrees get into your 20s and 30s, women are buying real estate on their own, having babies on their own. There's just a sense that we're really surpassing men in a lot of ways. And so that's why I was curious. Fast forward a decade or so, starting about five, four or five years ago, the the, the default premise of the conversation around women was that they were we were an underclass like we we were somehow uh, under the under the thumb of this patriarchy. And I was really interested and why that was, and if the rhetoric was really lining up with the reality, if there was something I was missing, or if there was some sort of visceral appeal 
in in signing on to this idea. I was really curious to figure out what we're getting out of this message. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I still don't entirely know. The book is I the problem with everything uh there's no one answer to it. That's there for is sure. no, no one, one answer solution and no solution. I I have to say though, the way messages get distorted online has to be one of the problems. Whether it's that you only hear the same voices echoing what you one believes, that's one giant problem. And another is we sort of make every voice the same, whether they're knowledgeable or stupid. Yeah. I mean, the the amplification. So you could say, oh, it's only a small number of people on Twitter who are threatening to cancel people or having these outsized reactions to microaggressions or purity policing, whatever it is. It's only a small number of activists on campuses who are deplatforming speaker, platforming speakers and um, pulling fire alarms, you know, during lectures, that sort of thing. That's true. But they've been given outsized influence. Do you think the college, do you think it's coming from campus or do you think it's coming from the grown up world, to use a bad term, and moving to campus? I think social media is the is the mediator here. It, the, there have always been radicals on campuses. Right. In in the in the 60s, they were actually, you know, doing physically radical acts. They were shutting down schools. They were there was violence. Uh, so, you know, in a way, what the activists are doing now is is fairly, fairly minor. Uh, it's all happening. Mu- much of it is happening behind screens, not all of it. But no, the big, big difference here is that we have a, a, a reward system in the public discourse that that incentivizes very, very simple, uh, reductive, sloganeering type of thinking and almost penalizes complexity. If you try to make a point uh, on social media that requires a couple of leaps of logic and requires scratching beneath the surface and actually getting at the truth of some article that people are freaking out about or some statement somebody made, that really takes too long to do. And so <laughs> and it certainly can't be accomplished in two tweets. Right. Right. So right. you have people uh, making, you know, completely rational, logical statements, whether it's Matt Damon talking about the Me Too movement or, uh, you know, uh, Obama now is, is being uh, is under threat of cancel now because he's on record as saying people need to stop uh, canceling people. <laughs> and and, you know, he's trying to make. It's not even that complicated, but it's like if it's not on the approved message and said in a completely concise, uh, hashtagable, memeable way, it's dismissed. And that to me is really, really troubling. That's where we run into severe sort of cultural hazard territory. Right, right. And you've talked a lot about the the loss of nuance in the book. And I, I'm just thinking about how many words can you fit on a swell water bottle? You know, you can't really go into a reasoned, let's say, bifurcated thought, because it has to be simple, it has to be fast, and we have no attention span, and we're all waiting to scream, yeah, me too, or right on, or whatever, whatever other way we can join the bandwagon. So why do women want to become victims? I don't know. I don't think they actually do. I, I certainly don't. I think that people generally, and it's not just women, like, you know, I, again, again, I sound like Tucker Carlson. I really avoid in this book. I, I don't, you know, in this book, I do not, I do not use words like triggered or right. victim or anything like that in earnest. I, right. You know, I'll, I'll, right. I'll talk about it in the context of the way this is part of the rhetoric now, but I really stay away from it. I would never talk about virtue signaling in any kind of sincere way. Right. Um it's not just women who are falling into this. It's just really all of us. Any, you know, our our identity categories are being sliced so thinly now that it's almost like people feel some sort of moral obligation to carry the flag of whatever tiny group they belong to. And if there isn't really anything to complain about that's right in front of your face, you have to invent these things. Uh, Yeah. I, I find it really interesting that this is happening when, you know, it, the world feels terrible and it feels out of control and, and the Trump era is is alarming and horrifying in all the ways that people have said. But it's actually never been a safer time for most people. Women have never been doing better. In in the aggregate, women are doing better than men. Um, obviously, in the highest quarters of power, you still have white men in charge. 
Uh, but in the aggregate, on a population level, women are doing amazingly. And I think it's really interesting that this is cor- this is corresponding with this kind of it's like a vehicle of style. Like we, there's a there's a default sort of conversation that is is uh, submitting something that's totally the opposite. Like we're not doing well. It's never been the world hates women. It's dangerous to walk down the street. It has never been safer to walk down the street in just about any city in America. I mean, am I wrong about that? No, no. Crime is low and women are are pretty safe to walk around. I mean, it's safe to walk around at yeah. night mostly. So I don't know why. I, I Again, I keep wondering what are we getting out of this? And I sometimes I wonder if it's just a sense of affiliation, that we're lonely. So we want to, uh, you know, belong to a group. And if the group happens to be uh, organizing around this message, then, OK, well, I guess that'll be my message, too. Maybe. Maybe that's it. You know, that's fascinating. So so when you talk about the sliver of an identifier that people want to stand behind and say, yeah, I belong and I, I've got grievances too. Let me just give me a minute so I can think of what they are. Let's talk about the word intersectionality because everybody uses it. And I deliberately don't use it because I don't think I know what it means. I could look it up, but I think what it means is you have more than one flavor of identity that is somehow minority. That's Whether, close enough. Okay. That's, that's, you're getting warmer. Okay. How would you define so, it? So intersectionality is a term that was coined by a law professor named Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, I think. She was a UCLA law professor at that time. She's now at Columbia. And it had to do with... Um, uh, a workplace harassment case. It, it was it was case law. She was talking about a, a real uh, workplace discrimination case at General Motors, where there were women of color, uh, black women, who were um, had uh, brought a lawsuit against the company for being discriminated against, not only uh, for being uh, women of color, but for being women. So so the whole idea was that this was the first time really people were looking at the ways that which, you know, you can be, you can have certain privileges and uh, lack of privilege based on one aspect of your identity and the same with another aspect. So we need to sort of look at at overlapping layers of oppression and also overlapping layers of privilege, by the way. So this is a very useful concept. It's perfectly applicable in a in a legal sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw herself said it was made to be a provisional concept. And over the years, for some reason, the word intersectionality has been diluted and, and elasticized into just it's become an umbrella term for this sort of larger ethos of of social justice awareness and quote unquote wokeness, which is another word that I am not going to use without quotes around it. Although I did consider calling this book woke me when it's over. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes. But to get to, to answer your question, intersectionality is is incredibly useful in and of itself, but it has been uh, misapplied. And so now, you know, instead of saying, well, uh, I'm, I'm just being a, a lazy thinker and hashtagging uh, my outrage, they can say, well, I'm an intersectional feminist. I, I, I strongly uh, suspect many people who say that have no idea what the word means. Right, right. I think like like so many of the ideas that you talk about in the book, I think a lot of people are ready to accept fully that if so-and-so says it, I admire or identify with that person, and I'm going to say it too, right. whether it means something or not. And increasingly, everything means nothing. And there's social capital in in agreeing, yes. right? Yes, so, there is. Yeah, there I, is. I talk in the book about about this huge Twitter brouhaha um, that ended up being called hashtag leggings gate. I don't know if you uh, remember that. But I it, do. Uh, is this ridiculous situation where it was there was a United Airlines uh, terminal in Denver and. Um, there was a family traveling, and and the gate agent said that the little girls could not get on the plane because they were wearing leggings right. with no skirt over it. And somebody, not even in line for that plane, but like in line for another plane, quite far away, noticed this, 
assumed it was, you know, massive misogyny and started tweeting about it. And it became this huge explosion and celebrities piling on yes. and everybody and like, you know, boycott United and United is sexist and on and on and on. And the fact was that the, the family was traveling on a employee buddy pass that had a very strict dress code that just happened to uh, require you to wear um, something over your, your leggings. Men used to have to wear three piece suits to, to travel uh, as on, the empo- on the buddy pass, meaning uh-huh. you're not really paying. Anyway, right. does anybody care about this? No. Not at all. It was much more fun to just turn it into a a massive, massive uh, virtue signal because that's exactly what it was. I guess we all feel so meaningless as ourselves. We all feel so infinitesimally about our place in the world that we're all looking for a crusade or we're all looking for larger meaning. And I'm just trying to sort of play devil's advocate here because that's right when people people get enraged and and it's another thing they don't get they don't work their way up to enraged they started enraged and that has to be that has to be examined too why do we get so angry so fast before we even know what we're angry about I think there's some gut level appeal there. It's it's a dopamine hit. So if you if you can go and express your outrage, and you know that that's going to get you a bunch of likes, uh, and that makes you feel good, so you're going to keep doing that. There's a reward system for feeling outraged. And look, let me be clear. There's a lot to be outraged about. We have. A, a horrendous, horrendous political situation on our hands. I am, I would be the last one to diminish uh, the level of alarm that we should all feel about this. But I would also say, for that very reason, it is all the more important for the the resistance, the left, liberals, Democrats, however you want to say, to have a coherent plan and actually. N- identify what the facts are, what the situation is, how to go about solving it, rather than just sort of trafficking in this blanket outrage that just really is catnip for the right. And it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere at all. I mean, that's what we've seen. Now, let me move ahead to your uh, chapter about humor, uh, which I naturally um, read before I read any other chapter. you talk about the very famous article that Christopher Hitchens wrote about women not being funny and how much you enjoyed that. And I have to say, when I first read it in Vanity Fair, it sort of annoyed me, but it didn't it didn't <laughs> it didn't move me to form a hashtag. And it didn't it didn't depress me. It just seemed something I could ignore. Um, but there is a marked lack of humor in our day-to-day uh, communications that has really changed. Now, when I when I joined Twitter in two thousand and nine or ten, I joined it for the humor. Mm, I joined wow. it for the comedians. I joined it for the observations that comedians made while walking through airports, because that was half of what Twitter was to me. And then, you know, and news sources. And then eventually it was taken over by angry, humorless, including me sometimes, people who are grieving, have grievances. Uh, what's happened to humor, in your opinion? And and again, and, and you know, and I think about campuses. All these well-known, well-paid comedians don't want to perform at campuses. Right. I don't know how I feel about that, honestly. Sometimes it makes me mad. I think for the money you're going to get, Jerry Seinfeld, just man up and go to the campus and do your show and take take your licks. But is the idea there that he would have to change his act in order to appease no. them? I don't, I don't know I, what I, their conditions are. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was more his protecting himself rather than his protecting the students. It may be, and it may be that there's a high enough probability that he would get called out and there would be some kind of campaign around him based on a joke he made on a college campus and he would get canceled. I don't know. To answer your question... What's happened to humor is that people can't laugh at themselves. Humor is about making yourself the ultimate butt of the joke. I mean, everybody knows this. If you're writing, if you're a satirist, whatever, you know, you always make fun of yourself harder than anybody else. And that's how it works. And it's also we become so 
um, we, we've we've really sort of misapplied this whole punch up versus punch down dynamic. So yeah. in comedy, of course, there's the idea that you can punch up. You can make fun of people who have more power than you do, or richer, who are a celebrity, a politician, whatever it is. It's not cool to to punch down. Right. I talk about this a lot in the book when it comes to women's. Uh, perceptions of men and their perceptions of the power dynamic, all this punching up at men, hashtag ban men, or we're going to we're gonna shame you on the subway for man spreading. We're going to take pictures and post them all over <laughs> yeah. Tumblr, this sort of thing. Yeah. It is, it's, it's operating on an assumption that men automatically have more power. We're punching up at them. And to me, that's just, that's backwards. You're actually, you're, you're, you're resubscribing your own uh, oppression. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So I think not just with the, with the woman conversation, with anything, we have, we have decided that so many different identity groups, well, first of all, we have divided everybody into these small identity groups. And then those identifications really revolve around notions of oppression. So basically, Everybody is sort of underneath somebody in some way, so we can't talk about them. There's really nothing to punch up at except for Trump and and white men, I suppose. But that gets boring. Yeah. There's really not a lot of room to work with. And and you know the fact is that most people in the real world uh, are fine with humor as it's always been. I mean, the Dave Chappelle special was a huge hit. It was the it was the blue check uh, brigade on Twitter and and the columnists and the and the you know this co- sort of these younger generations of media and that's a whole other conversation that were deciding that this wasn't funny. Well, audience actually thought it thought it was funny. Right. So let's talk about Louis C.K. He's coming back. I just read yesterday he's about to make a comeback tour. It's going to start overseas and then come here. What do you say about that? I love Louis C.K. I wish I could go to one of those shows. This may be an unpopular opinion, but surprise, surprise, I have plenty of those. I I, I think uh, whatever happened, happened between consenting adults, and we should just move on. It's whatever the market will bear. If he can forge a career and people want to come see him, I don't know why it's the job of some sort of uh, morality set of morality gatekeepers on social media to tell him he can't. And you know, I, I understand that the the women who were harmed in those situations felt they had less power than him. They did have less power. They did. But, but yeah. power is shifting all the time. Power is not is 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 not one thing. It's not it's not static. Right. It's fluid. Right. So I think it's it's kind of easy to hide behind that. Well, oh, you know, yes, they were consenting adults. Yes, they were all adults in the room. But, you know, some of them, uh, you know, were beholden to the other in some professional way. OK, OK. But like, let's let's be real here. Well, the fact is he can have a comeback and nobody can show up. That's right. And that's how you vote. Exactly. With your feet. Exactly. Yeah. Vote yeah. with your feet, not with your clicks, you know? Right, right. And Harvey Weinstein, who I guess his his people are, are creating a new narrative that he's just a shell of his former self and he has a cane and he looks all depleted. And then, on the other hand, his two friends, the, the I read an article that said he has two friends left, but they won't be named in an article, think that he's going to fight back. Um I personally find him repellent, and I don't think there's a comeback for him. But again, I suppose if somebody wants to fund his movie making, I guess they're welcome to do that. Except that he's a rapist, I think, and yeah, that, that goes that to jail. That one's hard to imagine. Yeah, I mean the thing with me too, it's it's evolving. I, I think that you know we forget how new all of this stuff is. We, we can't expect to sort this out. You know, you've got the Harvey Weinsteins on one side and the Aziz Ansaris on the other side. And, and these are very, very different cases. But, the you know, the, the ways in which the, the generational the generations break down, uh, you know, around their interpretations of these things, it's it's really complicated. And but it's worth talking about in, in a productive way possibly in-person way. Yes. Now, I have to say that my exhibit, uh, my exhibit C, my youngest daughter, and I really went through the Aziz Ansari story. And I feel that for people of Generation Z, I've she's heard, now 22. I'm, I'm hearing the word zillennials, by the way. Zillennials? Like, oh, like zoodles that are made of zucchini? <laughs> okay, sure. So the zillennials, and I'm an 
OK Boomer, you know, I think that we see that particular scenario in very, very different ways. Because when we grew up, we just had to, uh, this is a bad word to use, but we just had to suck it up and just move on, get right. through it. Hit them with your shoe, get out of there. Yes, Leave all the, that stuff. All that stuff yes. without telling everybody about it and and bravely telling a friend at a website how terrible it was. So that was a very difficult um, story for us to get through to a place where we understood one another. And uh, I think it, we did, but not without tears, by the way. That became a very emotional and who's hearing who dynamic uh, yeah. between mother and daughter. Yeah. And that story, I think, is the one that made us all understand that our generations each have a different ethos, and they're going to be parallel. They're not going to necessarily meet somewhere. No, and I actually don't think one one version is necessarily better than the other. When I started this project, uh, I really had this assumption that the way... I'm a Gen Xer, so the way my generation approached all this was better. We were tougher. So one of the things I talk a lot about in the book is the way Generation X people almost fetishize toughness. Yeah, we're aloof. We don't care. We're not vulnerable. Very that was cool. Very yes. cool. It was very much part of our our persona, our sensibility. Right. And millennials and younger people, for instance, may fetishize fairness in a similar way. And I actually think that there's value to both of those things and mm -hmm. we need to have more of an exchange because the fact is that millennials grew up with conditions that we didn't have to contend with we did not have to contend with ubiquitous online pornography right. we didn't have to right. contend with dating apps i've actually come around to where this issue of of, of sexual consent it's not my business as an older person what younger people want to do with that. I, I had an entirely different set of of social conditions when I was their age. So they should just be able to figure it out themselves. Right. Without our help. Well, Megan, The Problem with Everything is a book that I urge everyone to read. It, it made me go for my pen and underline. I did. I, I, I stopped at writing how true in the margins, but I felt I felt smarter when I read it than I had beforehand because you really ask yourself the tough questions and you're tough on yourself. And as long as you're, you know, as they would say, you're being fair. I think you're being fair, and I think you're brilliant. And I want to ask you to pivot and talk about the five things that make your day or week or time good, because you know we can all we can all agree that we need some some solve to this very difficult time we're living in. Yes, yes. So um, my f number one thing was very easy. That would be dogs. I love dogs. I, I really only like large dogs. I am somebody who has uh, owned uh, at various times a Newfoundland, a St. Bernard, and uh, a mystery mutt who was probably like a Bernese mountain dog, Great wow. Pyrenees mix. So I love uh, huge dogs. Now, wait, when you have a huge dog and you have to take this large dog to, let's say, the vet and it's not feeling well, can you lift that large dog? Um, I once had to enlist the mailman to help me uh, pick my dog up. Uh, I could, actually couldn't get her out of the car. She had been had just gotten spayed. I rescued her as a as a grown up dog, so she was a big dog, and she'd been spayed, and she was still not really out of the anesthesia. So I kind of <laughs> managed to like like get her out of the car. I kind of like sort of she just kind of fell out of the car onto the driveway, and she was just splayed out there. She wouldn't move, and uh, the mailman was coming down the street, and I said, I, I realize this is like really um, not, not uh, this is really like beneath your pay grade in, in so many ways uh, <laughs> and I and ironic in a lot of ways but I, I really need you to help me lift my dog up and bring her inside and, and he very nicely did. So that's the answer to that. Yeah. yeah. You've always been a doggy person. Yes. I know that. Yeah. Yes. Number two. Winter sunsets. Is there anything more beautiful? It, really, and dramatic. Yeah. They're so much more dramatic than summer ones, aren't yes, they? Yes, yes. There's just, there's, it's like psychedelic almost. Uh, my mother loved winter sunsets. She always talked about them every night. She would, it was just, it would just be something to remark on. And uh, 
No, I, I love it. I live, um, I'm really lucky my apartment uh, faces west, uh, so I get to see the sunset every night, and um, it makes me happy. Yes, excellent. Number three. Well, I know this is very common. Wide plank wood floors. You know what? You write about wide plank wood floors in your book about real estate. If I live to... I've I've ri- I've probably written about wood floors in just about every book that I've written except this one. Yes, this is a departure for me. Yes, it because is. I do not talk about hardwood floors. Right. Um, hardwood floors are such a uh, a social signifier and a class signifier, right? So, yes. And um, I uh, I've always you know growing up in the suburbs we, we did have wood floors, but I, I aspired to be a person in New York and I wanted to live in like a, a, a apartment on the Upper West Side with scuffed wood floors and a you know, radiator with chipping paint and all that kind of stuff. And, and you got it. Um, yes, I have had that. Yes. So, but uh, now the the wider the plank, the better. I'm I'm really I'm hoping one day maybe just like they're so wide, there's maybe just like three planks <laughs> going across the width of the room. I I feel a meme. The wider, the better. Right. Hashtag. Yes. Number four. Oh, the Bach B minor mass. Just a beautiful, beautiful uh, work. Just the one of the great work of Bach who. Um, is I think probably Maybe the, great, the greatest, greatest composer. composer. I agree. Yep. I agree. Yep. Um, and that's, uh, that's just a fact. And my father always, uh, you know, he, he the only the few times I ever saw him tear up was listening to Bach. That was really what got him. How interesting. Yeah. And yeah. me too. I, I have the same reaction. I love Bach. Number five. Well, I have to say, and I'm not just saying this to promote my book. This is really, really true. I I could not live without free and often frenetic exchange of ideas with friends uh, over drinks in person. And I, I really think this gets back to a lot of what the book is wrestling with. We we have so many discussions now uh, with, with the flattening effects of screens. We don't have time to sit down face to face and really think things through, think out loud. We don't even talk on the phone as much as we used to. And when right. we do talk on the phone, we're walking down the street or we're driving or we're doing something else. You know, the phone used to be attached to the wall. Right. And you would have to sit there and actually talk to your friend right. and focus. Uh, and so I really, really value being able to get together with smart, thoughtful, energetic, generous people and and really sort through the world and Talk about the problem with everything. Well, I know, Megan, that um, conversation that is idea-based and that is passionate is what's missing in this world right now. And I consider this podcast to be a tiny, tiny step in bringing back the art of conversation in person because it's great on the phone if you can, but it's so much better to look at someone and have that warm it's like we're all building the same foundation together yep and that's important everybody wants the same thing really which is just to to have an interesting life and to connect with other people right that would do it for me yep and have a big dog and have a big dog Megan, thank you so much for being here. The book is The Problem With Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. She would never, never use the word badass to describe herself, as you will read in the book. But in some ways, Megan Dom is a real thing. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Megan Dom, author of The Problem With Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars, published by Gallery Books, part of Simon & Schuster. You can follow Megan on her website at megandom.com or on Twitter at Megan underline Dom. You can, or maybe that's Megan underscore. I think it's underscore. Okay, yeah. Boomer. Okay, Boomer, right. Okay, Boomer, who likes Oxford commas. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, YouTube, and iHeartRadio, or anywhere else. My blog is at lisabernbach.com, where you'll find links and photos to all the things in this program. This podcast is produced in New York City by TheFieldTV.com. My engineer is Jimmy Regan. My team is Spressa Arucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.